Today's episode of the Counseling Tutor Podcast is sponsored by Web Healer. You're a counselor in private practice and you need a website, or you've got an existing website which you need help with. Web Healer are offering Counseling Tutor Podcast listeners, that's you, £100 off the cost of a website design and build. Now, Web Healer specialize in websites for counselors and psychotherapists. It's what they do. And the Web Healer team provide a completely non technical, done for you solution, leaving you to focus your time on your clients. Operating for 20 years, Web Healer are a trusted resource amongst counselors when it comes to getting your practice online. So get the package details and claim your £100 off coupon for your new website by going to counsellingtutor.com forward slash website. That's counsellingtutor.com forward slash website. Hi, I'm Rory and welcome to episode 315 of the Counselling Tutor podcast. I'm delighted to catch up again with Ali Finch, who is an accrediting member of the British Association of Counselling and Psychotherapy. She's a professional member of the Association of Counselling and Therapy Online, we know as ACTO. She's a registered member of Social Work England, has a postgraduate diploma in integrative counselling and psychotherapy, a Master's in Social Work, a BA Honours in Social Anthropology and an Advanced Certificate in online and telephone counselling. Today, Ellie is going to talk about using digital tools in an online environment. Really exciting. And with that said, let's get on with today's episode. Welcome to the Counselling Tutor Podcast, the must-listen-to podcast for counsellors, psychotherapists and counselling students. Here are your hosts, Rory Lees Oaks and Ken Kelly. Very warm welcome to episode 315 of the Counselling Tutor Podcast with Rory Lees Oaks and myself, Ken Kelly. Three topics today, starting off with ethical, sustainable practice, where we're going to be diving and swimming in the pool. That is neurodivergent affirming psychotherapy. We then go into our practice matter section. That's the CPD section of the Counseling Tutor podcast, where there is an interview with Ellie Finch, as Rory has kind of beautifully introduced. So we're going to be speaking about using digital tools in online therapy sessions. And then make sure you stick around to the end because it's student service where we recognize you, our students, on your formal journey. And I guess we're all eternal scholars when we become counselors and psychotherapists. We're going to be talking about something that is important to all, and that's developing an emotional vocabulary. And uh, it can be used as a counseling skill once we understand how to discuss and name emotions. So we're going to be diving deep into that. But starting us off, Rory, what would neuro... Uh, divergence affirming psychotherapy be that's a lot of big words and maybe maybe new for some it is and i was glad i wasn't asked to spell them um because yes. i would have probably got them wrong <clears throat> but what what we what we're saying really i mean i think i think if we look at the term affirming first of all <clears throat> affirming can mean different things but in this context what it means is that we are understanding that some people are neurodivergent. In other words, that they could be autistic or they could have ADHD or any of the presentations that fall under that neurodivergence umbrella. And that could be someone having Tourette's, um, somebody who is who may be transgender, although the <clears throat> I have to say the evidence that, that, that neurodivergence and autism is a little bit up in the air at the moment. There's no def- definitive evidence. Um, and it means that we are, we are accepting of people in our therapy room. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, EDI, you know, equality, diverg- uh, diversity and in- inclusion. And I guess people who are neurodivergent, and if we, if we talk about one specific area, people who are autistic come to the therapy room, they deserve the reasonable adjustments and the care and the thought that anybody else who who was um, you know who was a who was a, a minority, if you like, would expect. So part of that is that we, 
you know, we understand, we do the work to make sure we understand what neurodivergence is and how we can best support those who are neurodivergent, especially, and we'll probably talk a, a bit more about this, those who are autistic. Thank you, Rory. Beautiful introduction to a really important topic. I'm excited about this topic. If you listened last week, you'll have heard me hinting about it. Um, Rory and myself, for oh, well over a year now, have been really deep diving into the topic of uh, specifically autism, as you said, Rory. Uh, autism and counselling, how that comes together, what that looks like, what we can do as practitioners. Um, <clears throat> and on the back of creating a uh, a really deep dive course that we're about to to launch very very uh, soon in Counseling Tutor. Just go to counselingtutor.com and you, you'll get the info there of when we launch that. Um, we've decided to focus on this really important topic. We know there's a hunger uh, in counselling and psychotherapy within our niche, within our sector, uh, for information on this topic, both from an agency uh, perspective, but also from individual individual practitioner perspective. Um, and I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to start as we kind of introduce this topic, speaking about the wording, because it, it was purpose that the, the topic of today is neurodivergence affirming psychotherapy. And like you say, Rory, big words, difficult to spell. I wouldn't like to give it a <laughs> the, being neurodivergent myself and, and dyslexia falling un, beautifully under that umbrella. Um, I, I can happily say that and own that I wouldn't be able to spell that easily. Um, but w I think language is a great starting point. Why are we using a word neurodivergence? Is that not a, an, a, a, a word that kind of sets somebody apart from being, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's an interesting word. What's the thinking behind that, Rory? Well, I, I think, first of all, I think we have to acknowledge that the, the world of um, autism and neurodivergence is one that is developing. So the language we use today may not be the language we use in the future because this is such an emerging profession, um, and an so emerging um, cohort of people. They may eventually decide on their own terminology, but we have to use the terminology that um, gives us a common currency in therapy. So by using the word neurodivergent, what we're really saying is that is that everybody is neuro neurodiverse in other words we all think different we, we all have our own phenomenology but people who are neurodivergent are different from the norm and i'm using different with a very very small d so that difference could be um, sensory processing issues sounds lights that type of thing ways of connecting to the world so um you know some people who are new about diverge you can get very overwhelmed if they're in very noisy environments or textures or um tastes um and also i think i think when we talk about neurodivergence we're, we're really talking about how people communicate because with some neurodivergent people, they have different ways of communicating. And I'll give you a really good example of that. I have a grandson who is autistic and he is uh, nonverbal and he's the best pointer to things in the world. He, he, he can communicate quite easily by using his finger and pointing at everything. And unless we understand how to meet that, meet, meet that cohort of clients where they are, then two things are going to happen. We're going to miss them. In other words, we're not going to be able to make a therapeutic relationship. And even worse than that, they may not attend therapy because they don't feel understood. So that is why we use that language of neurodivergence. Thank you, Rory. Yes, and, and I guess as we kind of look at the language uh, we recognise that as professionals, as counsellors, as psychotherapists, we need a language that is commonly understood to be the correct language of the time. And I like how you mentioned that um, the way we talk about things, the way we name things, the way we describe things does change over time. 
Uh, there was a time where the word Asperger's would be used in diagnosis within the United Kingdom. That is no longer the case. That word has now been dropped. Um, there was at, at one time ASD or autistic spectrum disorder was a, a, a common term that might be used professionally. And it has fallen out of favor uh, specifically because it has the word disorder uh, bolted onto the end of that and uh, well the, the question is is it a disorder or is it just a differentness or a different otherness of way of being um, and when we speak about neurodiversity neurodiversity neuro meaning neurons the the part that makes up uh, I guess the processing of our brain diversity meaning the plethora of difference that is um, I guess present within the world we all think differently we all kind of maybe have a different phenomenology of how we see and interact and perceive the world so neurodiversity is the full spectrum of all people we are all within that spectrum of neurodiversity so when we hear the term divergence Divergence usually is, is a well, it is. It's a scientific word that suggests that something is off-center. It diverges. It is not bob-on in the middle. So neurodivergence, I guess, is the, the term that is um, professionally accepted at the moment as being an other, otherness as, a to, as opposed to neurotypical, which is used as the typical um, neurology. Or, or way of thinking or how the brain processes neurodivergence is slightly off from that it doesn't mean it's worse it doesn't mean it's bad it doesn't mean it's a disorder it just means that it is a difference um and you often say rory and i know you mentioned it in the course it's like saying what's better a mac or a pc they both kind of do yes. more or less the same thing but they do work on two completely different operating systems um, but one is not necessarily better than the other, although people will, uh, <laughs> we're going to have a lot of letters yeah, on that one. <laughs> that, that's a, yeah, that's another, that's another podcast. And it is, it whole, is. Whole but, of letters, Ken. but the point here is that we need a language that is commonly accepted, that kind of we can all understand and speak about and, and wording that we can use professionally. But we also recognise, and I think this is really important, that within the neurodivergent community there are those that will own their own terms and their own way of mm. speaking about who they are and how they show up and and my daughter uh, is autistic and and she likes to call herself neuro spicy you know i'm i've been on <laughs> uh, forums for for neurodivergent individuals because i myself am neurodivergent and i've seen people who say no that is not a good way to to refer to it neuro spicy but that's that fits for her and that's her ownership and i think it's a, it's an interesting time um but uh, uh, of course language is really important specifically as professionals in particularly if we're doing research or writing about this topic or studying or looking deep into this topic we need to understand the right language of the time uh, but like you say, Rory, it's it, it's uh, a moving feast, as they say. It's changing all the time. And it's interesting when you read the most up-to-date books, um, they, they usually start off by having a big disclaimer saying, you know, <laughs> the, the yeah. language in this book may change as time goes on. Yeah, so that's my thinking really on that, um, on, 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 the, on the language that we use. And I guess, Rory, why... Why is it an important time now to be looking into neurodivergence as as a as a counselor as a psychotherapist? I yes, I hear that you say that it's an otherness that we cannot ignore, but it seems all of a sudden. I'm going to be honest with you. It seems like it's now the this this uh, the volume has certainly gone up on uh, autism, ADHD, and neurodivergence in general. Yes, and I, I think I think there's probably a couple of reasons for that. Um, I think that neurodivergence uh, and, and it has has been around for years. Certainly, I, I've been, I've been dyslexic for as long as I've been alive, and I'm 66. So this isn't a new phenomenon. Um, but I do think that people now are beginning to gather together. I think one of the great the great strengths of the internet is it can bring communities together. People who may have just been sitting at their computer saying, do you know, is it me or is anybody else see the world as I see it? And all of a sudden, 
we we realize that we're not alone and there's a whole group of people who are just and i'm going to be quite a bit controversial here but wired up differently our neurology works in a different way and you, you actually said it beautifully ken you know there are some people out there that are pcs there are some people um that are out there that are max and there are some people that run on completely different operating systems and once we understand that it's all right to run on a different operating system i mean i run a mac some people use use microsoft other people use different operating systems but the crucial thing here is is that we acknowledge there are different operating systems that people think and experience the world in different ways and this isn't really new if we think about it everybody who ever studies counseling has studied phenomenology the philosophy of lived experience so why now i think that we're finding more people are beginning to first of all understand that their way of being and their way of viewing the world they're not alone there's a whole group of people out there and also i think and i'm very i think very strongly about this is that traditional psychiatry hasn't done the neurodivergent community any favors because um for a lot of the time people who are neurodivergent were given labels such as personality disorder or are given other kind of psychiatric diagnoses when really what they are is just experiencing the world differently and because that world hasn't taken the chance to adapt to them they get distressed and when they get distressed then they they become may become unwell um i mean it's not unusual for people who are autistic to have a meltdown and that is because maybe the world they're in isn't adapted to them and a good example of that is if i take my grandson <clears throat> to the supermarket it's very very noisy he gets very distressed he puts his fingers in his ears and he can't get out there quick enough and supermarkets now have quiet shopping days so you can go in it's nice and quiet they turn the music off they ask people to be respectful and quiet so people who have that kind of phenomenological view of the world can shop in relative safety and peace it doesn't make difference to anybody else i don't like supermarket music anyway and um, and they can get on with their lives so it's about being respectful and it's about understanding that people run as we say to use the analogy of computers on a different operating system and that we have to adapt to their operating system to be able to to help them yes i'm looking forward to getting into that part of this topic of um what why it's important to us and why we should be looking at it and <clears throat> you know with with that why now question I, I think you answered that beautifully and what we're seeing you know that the internet definitely has, has given so many more people a voice. It has also given so many more people access to information that may have been hidden before. Um, and also there's been a, a lot of research. There's been a lot of looking at neurodivergence and a lot, a lot of new understanding um, and a new understanding of uh, the, the past and the misdiagnosis as you've spoken about, Rory. It has come to its time, I guess, uh, where uh, individuals are self-diagnosing as neurodivergent uh, from kind of looking at their lives and what they're feeling and, and looking at how that matches up. And um, I think that <clears throat> one of the important things is that neurodivergence is now being shown as it actually is. Um, so and, and what I mean by that is w when I was a, a lot younger, I remember the only... Uh, reference to autism that I ever had was in a, a television program and there was a, a, a severely autistic child who was nonverbal, who was rocking, who was um, uh, showing a great uh, challenge in kind of interacting with, with the world. And I remember looking at that uh, and that was the label, that was the picture I, I, I attributed to autism. It was, it was um, nonverbal, rocking inability to interact with the world and of course uh, i am now diagnosed neurodivergent autistic and that was in my mid 50s and of course it was a big surprise to me because i didn't see any of that in myself i had a miscomprehension of what neurodivergence was and i think as professionals we need to understand it um i'm in a lot of um, late diagnosis groups for neurodivergence 
and within those uh, late diagnosis groups, it's really interesting having discussions. And usually, not always, but usually the person who is late diagnosed, diagnosed late in life, there's nobody more surprised than they are that they are neurodivergent. It's like they'll go, wow, I've lived for 55 years and I never knew this. It now makes so much sense. They're so surprised. It's like, wow. Um, but with, with there being more information, with there being more research, with there being better assessment tools uh, for, for kind of identifying neurodivergence, with there being a more clearly defined uh, picture of what neurodivergence is, more are owning it either as a self-diagnosis or looking uh, down a formal diagnosis route. And they will come into your therapy room. They have been in your therapy room. That's kind of how it is. You know, this is part of our world. And that's why it's important for us as counselors and psychotherapists. Because if somebody is coming in with a slightly different operating system, they come in with their Mac operating system, the last thing we want to be doing is offering them Windows-based solutions and programs to run and not recognizing where they're coming from because it might not work for them. They might feel unheard, unseen. And as is the case with many neurodivergent individuals, <clears throat> they can find that therapy didn't work for me. They didn't really get me or it didn't work for me. And I'm asking the question, did it not work or were they maybe not seen for who they are and i don't know the answer to that and i think that's what makes this such an interesting topic rory yeah absolutely and i think i can i can, sp I can speak to that if we if we kind of um go to the the overstretched analogy of the computer systems that we've been using um it takes time to adapt to a new operating system so i converted from using windows to a mac about five or six years ago and it was a huge learning curve and I had to do a lot of CPD around it to be able to be um, effective using a Mac. So, you know, if you're working with a neurodivergent client and you haven't got that training or that understanding, then you're going to be in the same position as I was trying to work out why the icons were on the right hand side, not the left hand side and where everything was and how it worked and the fact that I couldn't find anything. And once, once I'd done that CPD and once I'd done that training, um, once I'd accepted that Macs and PCs were totally different, you know, kind of environments, I can work between the two quite easily. Now, if I can use a PC, I can use a Mac, no problem at all. And I think, you know, using that analogy, it speaks to what therapists really need to be thinking about. It, and as you say, Ken, some people don't know they're, neuro, they're neurodivergent. Some people yeah. will come to the therapy room and it'll be unknown to both you and your client but if you if you could understand maybe that when the clients after after a session client might be a, a mac <laughs> not a pc then you can start adapting your practice to that you don't have to say oh i think you're a mac you think i think you're autistic but you can develop your practice and I, i'll give you one example of that um you know it might be someone comes and they say i really don't like bright lights i really struggle with bright lights um, you could just adapt your practice and shut the curtains or shut the blinds. And you may want to put that in your contract. You know, if you have difficulty with light, then, you know, we can, we could operate in an, an environment where we can, we can close the curtains or you might want a specific time to come and for therapy. We can work with that. So it's, it's about being flexible and it's about understanding that people are different. But as I say, to use the over, overused analogy of the Mac, you really, you really need how to understand how the operating system works, or at least a, a, a working idea of how to use it. Because if you can't, you'll just stumble, and that, I think that what that's what happens with, with with therapists. They just stumble. They're not deliberately trying to disadvantage the clients. They just don't know, and they just yeah. they just make and mistakes. That's okay. And and that's yeah, okay yeah, yeah. not to know. <clears throat> it, it really is. I mean, it's <clears throat> that's that's why we do CPD. Um, we see this, uh, Rory and I see this topic as really important, uh, I guess, yeah. both being neurodivergent. Um, it's, a, it's an important topic. I, I know mm. what it was like pre-my diagnosis. I know the stories I told myself and, and why my life mm. was the way it is and how different that is now. It's almost freeing. But also there's, a, there's a quite, quite a, 
a journey that one goes on through diagnosis, which I've undertaken. And we want to share this topic with you. Uh, We're going to be bringing it uh, for the next few weeks and deep diving into things like Rory has just touched on, making reasonable adjustments, uh, knowing what kind of signs or presentations we might see that may indicate that a person might be neurodivergent. Of course, we're not there to diagnose. That's not what this is about. A a client may even come in and say, you know what, I've just been diagnosed and I'm now trying to adapt my life. Uh, It may be a client coming in and saying, you know what, I think I might be and I wonder what you think of that. And you can work through emotions with them as they maybe go through a formal diagnosis. So there's, it might be a, a, a family member uh, somebody coming in mm. and a family member is neurodivergent and, and, and speaking about that and uh, gi- giving us opportunity for areas to serve and help. Uh, so it's an important topic. We look forward to bringing it to you. Today has just been an intro, an overview, talking about why we're bringing this topic. We've got lots to bring on it. Uh, and if you're, of course, interested in training formally, we do have a certificate uh, in uh, working with uh, autistic clients. And you can get information on that by just going to counselingtutor.com. So there it is. That's our ethical, sustainable practice and start of a brand new shiny topic, Rory. We now move on to practice matters where uh, we you met up with Ellie Finch. Ellie's been a real good long-term friend of counseling tutor and this topic this topic it is so of the now using digital tools in an online therapy session so many of us now working blended you know maybe we're doing a little bit of online work how can we how can we bring more value to that Rory tell me about this chat that you had yeah Eddie. well we we're, we're, we're really are pleased to welcome back Ellie who <clears throat> will be sharing your insights on creative ways to work online using digital tools such as sandboxes. And she really recently discussed these methods, as you say, in her lecture for the CPD library. I caught up with her, and this is what she had to say. Practice Matters is proudly sponsored by the Counselor CPD Library. To access top quality, relevant continuing professional development for your practice, that you can do at a time that suits you and all for less than the price of a cup of coffee, visit counsellingtutor.com. The world of online therapy has really now come of age. Since the COVID epidemic of the 2020s, people now are used to working online, which means a huge shift has taken place in the type of tools or activities that usually were quite easily accessible in a face-to-face environment, but provided a bit more of a challenge in a virtual environment. So I'm delighted to welcome Ellie Finch. She's been on the podcast before, who's done a fantastic lecture in the Counselor CPD Library on the use of a digital sandtray. So Ellie Finch, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Rory. So the first thing is, uh, I, I guess there there is a bit of a challenge, isn't there, that moving from face-to-face environments to um, online environments means that, that the tools that, that, that therapists used to use may not be easily replicated or easily available. I'm thinking of things like cards. I'm thinking of all sorts of, of things, sand trays, um, any materials that people use. But what you've done is you've... Um, developed um, a whole new way of working, I think, online. So just tell me a little bit about what led you to developing these these ideas and, 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 and where that idea came from. I guess I, I wouldn't like to take the credit for developing it all, but I, I definitely have embraced it wholeheartedly. Um, I, yeah, I, I, think, I think what's happened with me is my personal kind of situation um, made me really like primed and ready to uh, embrace digital tools and online work um because um when when covid when covid started back in 2020 i'd already led quite a sort of restricted life because my daughter's um my daughter's got some additional needs and um our life was quite kind of restricted already so when when covid happened it kind of it kind of didn't change that much um and for us and 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 but what did change was that people were really open to using all these digital tools working online came across the counseling tutor 
course on working online and and did that and loved it and and um and I realized that it was the time to use video games and digital sand trays. And these were all things that were in my mind and I hadn't fully integrated into my practice yet. And it just made absolute sense. I was faced with um, clients. Um, I worked with a lot of young um, young people, children, uh, especially, but adults as well. And, and it was just, um, it was very bland being in little boxes um and um on 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 zoom and just trying to 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 find creative ways to work and it just made absolute sense to me to start using digital tools like video games and and digital sand trays um in my work to to provide something um really accessible and engaging to my clients yeah absolutely and i I think that's interesting um because that, that that kind of move into the digital realm may actually suit some clients more than others i'm thinking of maybe younger people who've grown up with digital tools who've grown up with the you know the facebooks and the the twitters that ages me a bit it's called x now isn't it and the (laughs) and and the, the, the tiktoks of this world so there's something i guess for me about it being familiar you know when you work online it's is that something that's very helpful in therapy that that when using things that are familiar, the internet and digital tools is is helpful maybe for younger clients. Yeah, I think I think it definitely is speaking their language and bringing therapy into their comfort zone. And it's not necessarily all like some children and young people don't don't aren't interested in this way of working, but a lot are. And I think as sort of older <laughs> older therapists, um, we we may feel a bit less um comfortable in that space not all like some people might be really into that stuff but um i think generally there's um there's a kind of um gap between um the young um clients and the older older and i'm kind of counting myself in that who aren't there's this phrase isn't there digital native who, who maybe aren't digital yes. natives and 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 i think you know we don't have to put people in those boxes necessarily because everyone um embraces different things in their lives but but um i think it is it is about um, meeting people in their comfort zone wherever we can and in any way with our clients and whatever that is whatever it is their interests are and what what, how their brains work and what makes 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 them um, spark and engage with things, right? Absolutely, and, and and our work is all about connection. It's all about meeting the client where they are, and it's quite interesting what you said about older therapists. I, I guess I would fit into that band of older therapists. I'm time to record this podcast. I'm 66 now, um, <laughs> which makes me positively ancient to anybody who's <laughs> under 14. Um, but um, you know, I've 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 embraced the digital world and um you don't have to do you don't have to do a lot if you're working online you don't have to do a lot i think if you're online you've already you've already if you if you're using video platforms like we're recording this uh, interview on you've already crossed quite a big threshold i think because yeah. you 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 you've, you've probably set your camera up you probably set your microphone up you you know what the data protection is so you've done a lot of that work it isn't a great jump then to thinking well what digital tools uh, uh, that can be used and 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 just just talk through i mean you you show this really well in the lecture that you gave and there's also three case studies that are in video form that show it being used but just start us off with you know what are the benefits of using a sandbox in general in therapy just in case people aren't aware of the the benefits of a of a sandbox what is a sandbox i guess yeah you can call it a sandbox or a sand tray and and this is um you know a a lovely in 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 a traditional in-person work you'd have a a box with sand in um you could also put other other kind of like like some people put lentils in or something if, if people don't like the feeling of sand um and um and you have all these um, miniatures and items and what it enables is a a non-verbal way of expressing yourself so and it doesn't rely on creative talent either so some people might be very kind of um, put off by the idea of needing to paint or draw or or use clay in a um, uh, creative therapy session but 
you having already it's like it's almost like making a collage or something where you've already got the the miniatures miniature items of figures um that you can place in the sand and start creating scenes and express yourself without needing to f- feel like you need some special talent or um needing to use words and it can um really help then for the therapist to un- understand what's going on in someone's in someone's world in in some in, in their mind and what's happening for them yes and i know when i've used figures in in therapy one of the one of the interesting things is that it's not about kind of therapists that I mean sure there are therapists who might analyze the positioning of of figures in the sand tray but it, it's about asking the client what it means to them isn't it yes yeah. yeah so just talk us through someone's got made the figures they put them in groups or whatever how would how would you work with that what how would you you, you, you observe what they've done what would your interaction be with a client? So I demonstrate in those role plays a bit, I think. So um, I would be asking them, um, I, I might ask them to, so we don't have to sort of say, oh, what, who does that represent or what does that represent? You can start just saying, you know, what, what's this, what's this, you know, they might have put a, a horse in there and you go, oh, what's this horse, um, what's this horse thinking and, or doing and what, what are they about to do? Or you can start sort of really engaging with the scene in its own right and exploring that with them so that it kind of um, isn't so, um, it kind of almost adds that, that kind of, I, I don't I don't know what quite the word is, like maybe a protective protective element where you're not talking so um, clearly about some actual situation in their life, but it can be used as metaphor, it can be used as a way of exploring something without it being so directly um, spoken about as well, I would say. Yeah, so I guess also it, sometimes it's, it's useful for, ch- people who don't really want to talk too much they they, yeah. they they you know they can just confirm and say you know it's it's helpful not every, i think not every client you know we talk about talking therapy but not every client wants to speak do no they? <laughs> no and i think this is it this is why i i love using digital sand trays and video games because it doesn't rely on that you things things you know you have experiences together you ha- in in video games you have a uh you they they can ex- clients can express themselves just by by selecting items and placing them in the sand tray and that could be all they do yeah yeah and it can be therapeutic just to do that you know like um to make your own sand tray as a therapist is a really lovely thing to do because you can take a moment for yourself and you can go what is it that's what's what is it that's going on for me and what does it look like if i put choose things without thinking too much about it and putting them in a sand tray yeah so maybe that's one for supervision you know when you when you when you're when you're choosing your sand tray or choosing your digital sand tray you know it's it's supervision are there any kind of practical um considerations in terms of um choosing online tools such as data protection you know how it captures data can you talk us through what what decisions you might have to make when looking i know you've you've demonstrated a particular tool in the in the in the lecture but what what considerations do you need to think about regarding uh client and data protection yeah absolutely there really is things to consider and i think it, it um some people might sort of like run rush off and and you start using digital tools without thinking these things of these things and so it's important to to raise awareness of them and it's also some people might be kind of um almost held back because they're worried about doing things wrong and i think that's also something that i want to encourage people to kind of um um know that they just need to take these things into consideration and they can use digital tools so data protection like you said is 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 really important um complying with the data protection regulations for where you're where you're based so in the uk it's gdpr in in the us it's um HIPAA compliance um, and 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 making sure that you are thinking about things like if um, about about where any data if any data is stored by the application you're using and I do go into that really quite meticulously in the yes. lecture I've got a lovely document that I've created like um, very it's lovely I love it and it's got all the things about privacy policies for each app and and um, if they if they're storing any data where it might be stored so you need to think about that if you're based in the UK if there's data stored in the US you need to think about that carefully and let your clients know so what what's really important is getting your um, clients informed consent if you're going to use these tools so giving them the information they need and the information about um, any limitations around data protection or um, 
the location of where any data is stored by the app and, and making sure that they are aware of that before they give their consent to use it. And also thinking about security um, um, elements as well. So um, I use video games a lot, so it's really quite important to me that I make sure that people don't use the in, in-game chat and things like that because you know you can use um your video your usual video platform instead um so yeah it's really it's really important to think about those things and um and and i have so what i have actually is like for my counseling agreement i have like a menu of applications and that the, what i provide in in the digital sound tray training is almost like a a, a starter of that really as um this kind of information for my clients so that they can be informed about what they're using in our sessions. Yeah, so we 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 love a good document. Yeah. Um, here at Counselling Towers, certainly certainly one that clients can understand and and you know I think the key here is informed consent. You know the the worry with um, AI is that it scrapes information, people's information, and once it's on the servers, you can't get it off. You know, yeah, and you want to make sure that you're you're really thinking about any any data that they're inputting into the application, like their email address, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and location, I guess. You know, things like location, and there's there's so much that modern technology kind of scrapes from you, isn't it? You know, what what did you have for lunch? You know, that type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you want to be really mindful of it, but also not not. Um, What's the, I mean, it's just not being put off by it, isn't it? And also just kind of, yeah, making sure you're informed so that you can inform your clients, do it in a way that's age appropriate. But, um, and yeah, making sure that they're aware of these, these and things. And this is all covered in your lecture. This You, you, yeah. you cover this in your lecture. Now, we, we, the main lecture is about the digital sanctuary, but when I went in to look at the lecture, I was absolutely uh, delighted, I think is the word, to find that it wasn't just your lecture. There's three other videos of you doing demonstrations or or or, or application of, of digital tools just speak a little bit about that oh yeah i really thought it was very important so in the lecture i go over there's nine digital sand trays that i give everyone the a kind of um guide to really but what i wanted to do is make sure that people had a sense of not and I really um, spell it out. It's not it's not the way to use a digital sand tray. It's a way, right? It's just the way I use it and the way I used it with that particular person in that session that you see. So, um, um, but it's just a sort of starting point for people to to go. Oh, this might be possible for me. This might be possible for my clients. And so my colleague Rika um, and I did um, a, a, a role play in Rethinkly which we used to be called ProReal, which is an avatar-based software, which can be used like a digital sand tray. And we did it in Simply Sand Play as well, which is um, a lovely digital sand tray that's very accessible um, um, for therapists and clients, I feel, to to use. So we did role plays in that. And it was really nice because the in the actual lecture, um, we just got little snippets, but I was able to make uh, two longer versions of it. And at the end, Rika actually, as herself, reflects back on what it was like to use a digital sound tray, which is really interesting to hear. And I also did two role plays with um, some young actors, a f- uh, mother and daughter pair as a family and a young teenage boy um, using um, a digital sand tray um, in Minecraft, which I've created with my colleague, Dan Noble. So we, I did some role plays with those, um, with those actors so that we could demonstrate the, the, sand tray therapy world in minecraft as well i mean i have to say it's it's one of the most comprehensive uh lectures almost it's almost well it is it is some of it is actually i would say in the training sphere um <laughs> and 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 people can watch that and it, it it really is i was mesmerized by it because um it's, it's not an area that i i use digital sand trays and 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 that, that type of thing but i was absolutely mesmerized by it and i guess one of the things i took away from it was um it might sound daunting um initially mm. But actually, once once you understand the mechanisms of it, which is which is very very straightforward, and as I said, if you're working online, you're already halfway there because you could use a computer, you could use the audio, you could Absolutely. connect to the internet. You're you're more you're really more than halfway there. Just taking that extra step can add, add so much value, I think, to the client's experience. 
Yeah, and I, 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 I think that's it. And I, what I made did purposely was start with the 2D, really simple sand trays. There's one um, um, called the online sand tray by Dr. Karen Freed. And that's just um, online, you know, it's free and it's um, a link that you can send to your client. They can use it at their end and the data, as far as I'm aware, gets just stored on their local, com- on their computer locally. And it's very simple to use. It's just drop and, and move. And um, you can just get started with that, obviously still with informed consent. But, um, and I also made this, which I'm really excited about this button, um, activity where I, I think I explain it in the sand tray, but um, that's what you were talking about earlier, where how do you translate these traditional tools that we use on to online work? And I remember literally having my button tray or physical buttons up at the camera and I'm showing Rory how I did it with, with my hands now. <laughs> like, oh, wait, which one is it? Which one, the blue one? I don't know. Ah. Um, so um, I, I made this um, button activity so um, people can use use this activity digitally and just it's a PowerPoint it's free I, I've got it on on my website um, um, when when people subscribe to my mailing list it's like a free gift and um, and it's just this lovely thing that that's very easy to use it's a PowerPoint that you can share with your clients and they can move the buttons around select one that represents them or their family members and start using using that. Yeah, and when you're talking to buttons, you're not talking about click buttons. What you're talking about is buttons that fasten your clothes, aren't you? That's you're that. right. Yeah. yeah, like lovely, pretty, different shapes, yes. um, rough or text like buttons. Yeah, all those different buttons that could that could represent us in different ways. It's. Yeah. It, I have to say, I, I I was completely blown away by the lecture. I mean, all our lectures produce incredible. Um, helpful materials but this this one I think um, more than ever because just just because of the sheer scale um, of of how much you've put in and the demonstrations is absolutely marvelous um, if, if you're Thank interested you. in in Al, uh, the work that Ali does um, if you go to counseling tutor and look at the podcast tab counseling tutor.com go to the podcast tab look at episode 315 we're going to put some links into our website so you can um know a little bit more about ali and her work and and um and you know just just you know who you are and, and what you do and as we come to the end of this interview what what do you hope that people will take away um for, well take away take away from your lecture well, I hope they feel empowered to start using them and um, find the one that would suit them. It's really important that it suits you as a as a as a therapist, but and also your clients, of course. And just have a little practice. Have a little practice with a colleague. Um, um, have a go if you're using it online. Have a go at, at 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 doing what you need to do, like maybe screen sharing or them screen sharing the, your client screen sharing from there and have a go as the client have a go as the therapist and just have a play and see that I think what the thing is is really important seeing that actually you're just going to be using your honed normal therapy skills just in this other space it's not like you have to learn anything new in that way you're you're transferring them over to the digital world and you know what you're doing fantastic um the lecture is in the library now using the digital tantra by Ellie Finch is in the Councillor CPD library, along with the other videos that are practical demonstrations and, of course, that reflection by someone who's role-playing the clients at the end. So it just leaves me to say, Ellie Finch, thank you so much for joining us. Big thank you to Ellie Finch. Big thank you to you, Rory, holding those important discussions, uh, bringing us the CPD. And, of course, if you enjoyed what Ellie Uh, has just been speaking about with Rory. As Rory has said, uh, you can get that lecture in the Counselling Tutor CPD library. That is for qualified professionals only. Uh, And if you are a member of that, log in and you will see that uh, lecture is there in recently added lectures. If you're not a member of the Counsellor CPD library, just go to counsellingtutor.com for less than the price of a cup of coffee per month. Uh, You can have access to hundreds and hundreds of hours of top quality CPD mm. that makes a difference in your practice from from the top experts that uh, that we rub shoulders with here at Counselling Tutor. So that was Practice Matters. We now move into 
recognising you, our students, in Student Services. Student Services is sponsored by Counselling Skills Academy. Can't tell you how many times Rory and I have heard counselling students say that learning skills and knowing that they're using them effectively is really, really challenging. The reason for this is because we don't get to see another counsellor using skills in a real live session. In reality, this means that we're asked to learn something that we can never see demonstrated in a real setting. And it's no wonder that many of us are left feeling unsure. If you want to see counselling skills used in real sessions by qualified therapists, so this is real sessions, real presentations and real use of skills, then go to counsellingskillsacademy.com. There's some free videos on skills, including a full live session that you can have a look at. Gain the competence and the confidence of knowing you're using your counselling skills effectively. Just visit counsellingskillsacademy.com. And today in Student Services, such an important topic, developing an emotional vocabulary as a counsellor. And it's a skill, really, isn't it, Rory? It is, and you know we've all we've all heard that cliche that therapists kind of kind of laugh about with when when the client tells you something and you go, "How do you feel about that?" And it's one, it, you know, I think everybody thinks that therapists say that, and I'm sure some do, but also I, I think when you're developing your skills palette, certainly during training, it's really good to know what emotions are. You can name the emotions. And also, I think sometimes the most helpful intervention is where in the reflection you say, you seem really happy about that. And sometimes clients don't really know what their emotions are. Um, I was a a school uh, counsellor for many years. And I was uh, one of the things that really struck me working with, with young people was that some of them didn't have an emotional vocabulary and they would have grown up to be adults without an emotional vocabulary. And as a therapist, just pointing out how the client's presenting or the, the person you're working with in your skills and you say, well, you look at you, when you talk about it, you look really happy, if they are happy, that can be really useful because that might be something out of the awareness of the person that you're working with. You go, yeah, you might go, yeah, I actually, I actually am very happy at that. And I, I remember for my own therapy, I was I was talking about a subject, and this person said, uh, well, my therapist said, you're really angry about that, aren't you? And I'm like, no, I'm not angry. And then she kind of looked at me, it's like, yeah, yeah, I think I am angry. And I didn't realise how angry I was about it. Um, so naming emotions can be really, really useful. So I guess the first port of call is to understand what emotions are are give them the names and and be understanding of that and there's lots of resources that that we could point to that will give you like an emotions wheel where emotions are are shown and what they really mean and you know i I talk about anger as the emotion but that's a secondary emotion because anger is usually a bodyguard of primary emotions such as shame or fear or or uncertainty um you know, if you meet someone who's angry, usually they're either ashamed or they're frightened um, underneath that. So developing as a student a a vocabulary of emotions and being able to um, not only share them back to a client and say, you sound, but also, you know, in the reflection from yourself, you know, when I hear that, I feel very sad. Um, it's, It's so useful because it gives a context to the story the client's telling us. It's, it is literally the music behind the words. Yes. It's such an important topic, and I've got so much to, so much happening in my head at the moment that I need to slow myself down as we kind of go into this because I, I see this as, as so, so valuable for us as counsellors and psychotherapists. So here's the thing. We're not taught... Um, at least in the Western world, during our schooling, uh, or at least I wasn't, and maybe it's changed considerably since I was schooled, but we're not taught about our emotions, how to regulate our emotions, what our emotions are. And we end up 
going into the world with very basic words. I'm happy today. I'm sad today. I'm angry today. We can name those very, very basic emotions. But of course, emotions are nuanced. They are nuanced, you know. So um, what understanding emotional vocabulary is for us as counselors and psychotherapists is to be able to go beyond the word happy, sad, and angry, to bring in variants of that. Because angry, are they angry? Are they absolutely livid? Are mm. they wanting to explode? There's variations of that. Are they frustrated? You know, there's different variations that sit under the same kind of word or same kind of emotion. There's, there's almost like a little volume control that works with that. You know, are you happy or are you jubilant today? Are you, you know... Ecstatic. Uh, yeah, ecstatic. You know, there's different words. Now, why this is important is because counselling is based on the relationship. We know that. And it's based on the, the, the client bringing in where they're at what's happening in their life, and they're sharing this with a, with a fellow human being that starts off as stranger, but trust builds up. And where the real magic happen is where the fellow human being, which is you, the counsellor, really hears them, really sees them, and feeds something back where the client goes, yes, yes, it's like that, you get me. And you can see and feel the change in the energy of that person where they've been recognized, where they've been, where they've been seen. Now, very often, the emotion that that person may be feeling with inside their body, they don't have a word for it because we weren't taught that vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So us as the counselor having a broader vocabulary that we can attribute to emotions and kind of put some words in to let the client find the one that best fits and resonance, resonates with them increases their vocabulary. But more importantly, it shows that we truly understand how that person is feeling and they're there in his relational depth that's when the real magic happens yeah. that's when the trust goes to that next level it is so so important i have to throw in because we speak spoke in the beginning about neurodivergence and understanding what that is there is a condition that falls under the neurodivergent umbrella and it is called alexithemia and it is a term that describes a, a, a problem with interpreting or actually feeling emotions. It comes from um, Greek, loosely translate to no words for emotions. We've got podcasts on this. We're going to be discussing it more in depth of how we might work in that kind of a situation where the client just doesn't have the ability to be able to tune in and, and, and feel their emotions. So we're going to recognize that. We're going to park that for now. <laughs> we're going to go back yeah. to those that can feel and do see their emotions. But I think it's important in recognition of our new topic of neurodivergence to kind of uh, uh, put that out there. So I'm going to go through some common emotions. I'm just going to throw some, some words in here. We're going to give you links for these. Uh, and we're also going to give you a uh, free download of a feelings wheel, which is really helpful. Feelings wheels kind of have a lot of different feelings on a wheel linked to the base emotion. So if we're talking about anger, uh, it might be hostile. You know, you might feed back and say, wow, you were feeling really hostile in that kind of a situation. Agitated, jealous, contemptuous that's a big word i wouldn't know what that meant but no. there it is it's yeah. under anger sadness sadness shame disheartened hopeless agonized you know it different words for the same kind of thing if somebody f is fear they may anxious mortified overwhelmed hysterical love um appreciative compassionate Joy, tranquil, amused, jubilant, content. So that's, there's just a few words uh, that we can throw in to give just more meaning, more depth to the emotions that we describe and the emotions we work with. This is our work. We're working with yeah. emotions, people's feelings. Knowing words to attribute to that is just an asset to you as a counsellor. Yeah, and we talk a lot about empathic attunement. And, you know, if yeah. you think about tuning a radio in, um, you could, we've all done this probably, tune, you do radio dial to tune in a radio station, you tune it in, and it's slightly off frequency, and it's a bit grating. You can still hear it, but it's a bit grating. 
And then you twist that little wheel a little bit more, and all of a sudden it becomes crystal clear. High fidelity, sharp. And it's like, yes, there's the joy. That's it. And that's what like that's what it's like to be heard by a therapist, as opposed to maybe a friend who who talks in very vague terms. He's slightly off that frequency. But when you go see a therapist, the therapist tunes into you, gets really crystal clear on the frequency of what your emotions are. And it's the same, it's the same feeling. It's like, yes, I feel heard. I feel that someone's tuned into me. And I think that's I think that's so important. And you know, we forget that many people who come to therapy, people may not even switch the radio on. People may not be listening at all. They may not even be touching the tuning in dial. So it's really important that when clients meet us, we meet them where they're at and we could be, we may not be able to get exactly there, but we we could get so close to to their frame of reference that they feel understood. It's almost as if that the person who's speaking to them can read their mind. And how many times as therapists can have we work with a client and really accurate reflection of an emotion? And they've said it's like reading my mind. It's like magic. Yep. This, and it's not magic. It's it's the developing uh, that attunement through the use of emotional language. And, and that's the skill right there. That's the advanced counseling skill to be able to get, yes. pick exactly the frequency the client's on, tune into it so it's crystal clear reception. So there's the outcome for you, that crystal clear re- re- reflection. And, and uh, the big question is how, how? You know, so I've got I've got the um, the feelings wheel in front of me here, and we'll share this in the uh, in the show notes. So make sure you just go to counselingtutor dot com, click on the podcast tab, go to episode three one five. You're going to be able to download the your, your feelings wheel, have that uh, to to reference. But it's not about looking at all the words on the feelings wheel and going right. I've got to remember them. Here we go. I'm going to remember this one and this one and this one. And this I'm telling you now. There's hundreds and hundreds of words on the feeling yeah. wheel. <laughs> there really are, and you'll see kind of as it spreads out. So if we take angry, then uh, one out from angry might be bitter. It might be mad. Another one out might be. Um, depressed, betrayed, uh, provoked, you know, so there's different levels of it. Um, Also, if somebody comes in saying, you know, I'm really feeling provoked by my partner or my colleague, we might be able to link in and say, wow, it feels like anger behind that, because we know that that word sits in that emotional slice on the wheel. And that's the one side of it is kind of learning those words. But there's more to it than that. As is so often the case in counseling and psychotherapy it's not just about learning the the theory there's a practice element and a self development element and this is the important part here so if you're journaling and if you're a student and this is of course in um, our student services section in in during your co- uh, journey as a student you'll probably be asked to journal on a daily basis of where you're at and that is where you get to start looking at your emotions and putting words mm. to your emotions and really take some time when you're journaling go well I, I had that situation today that was really frustrating for me and then go well okay what was frustrating where where did I feel that was it in my chest was it in my tummy was it mm. kind of midway was it just in my head um what was happening for me is it frustration can I find a different word let me look at my feelings we're all that word there feels a little bit better. And we develop our own vocabulary. So we can't be there for another with their emotions if we don't understand our emotions. The, the, the client can always only go as far as the counselor can go. So if we are not able to, at some level, interpret and understand our own emotions, how can we then be there with somebody else in their emotions truly empathically i guess that's the question so emotional journaling be patient be patient with yourself as you're exploring your own emotions and if you're working in skills practice and you want to try kind of naming emotions be patient with yourself that you may call it wrong it gives it's wonderful when we call it wrong you know if you go oh that seems like it makes you really angry person might go actually no no 
I think I was just more frustrated. It gives us a great opportunity to yeah. make sure that our frame of reference is aligned. Um, when you go for your own counseling, when you mm. go for your own personal counseling as a student, which is required certainly in the UK on, on the, on the courses we run here, um, there's an opportunity to look at your emotions, hear how another professional might name them to, um, See how you can name them in a healthy way within within the sessions. Try it in your skills practice. If you, uh, you you're going in with an emotion from the car drive on the way, and the person that cut in front of you that you basically want to get out of the car and hit their car with a big baseball bat, think uh, how am I gonna how am I gonna word that, and how can I describe that emotion, and how does that get reflected back to me? So there's. I guess some uh, thoughts around how you might develop that emotional um, vocabulary is the word I'm looking for, Rory. Yeah, that's not words. a big. That's not a big word. Neither of us can spell. I know. Ken. I know. <laughs> and and you're, you you are absolutely right. And and it, it's it would it's amazing that you know we we think we've got a whole palette of emotions. And and a lot of us have some. Some people may have it more defined than others, but I'm always amazed, even nowadays, where where people, you know, certainly when I was practicing, people would come and the, the the anger emotion was something that was almost forbidden. Society tends to say, "Oh, you can't be angry. You shouldn't be angry." Mm-hmm. Um, and of, of course, it, it is another emotion. It, it is it is a it, it is an emotion. The the, the outcomes, the behaviour around anger could cause difficulties but being angry in itself is is a is a relevant and you know just emotion and it's amazing how many people when you reflect anger back or or the you know the 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 kind of hidden pieces behind anger such as maybe jealousy or fear or um they, they sometimes takes a bit for them to be able to own that because society doesn't like to, to have angry people. Yeah, anger is a anger is an emotion. So there is a I think there is some some area in therapy of teaching people their emotions and also making sure all emotions are available. I had a, I had a, I had a colleague many years ago who used to say, "You can be as angry as you want in the therapy room as long as you don't trash me or the room." <laughs> that was in a yep. contract. And um, and how helpful for someone who is scared of showing that emotion. So very important that we understand the, the panoply of emotions and our own. We, we can't be there for others unless we have a good understanding of how to turn that tuning wheel on the, on the emotional frequency scale for ourselves. We can't mm. do it for ourselves. We can't do it for others. I, I really love how you've kind of brought in what is so, so important here, and it's the acceptance of the emotion, you know. Maybe uh, if you think about introjected values or mm. the 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 lens, the the lens that the client may be looking at the world through, they may have been shown at a younger age that certain emotions are just not shown. You do not show that. That is not appropriate in the world. You know, anger. We'll take that as uh, as, as an example. And the the truth is, we all experience anger we all experience these emotions it is the human condition and it's interesting to me that um almost in society there are uh, certain emotions are welcome if you're happy uh proud accepted respected valued creative loving i'm reading these from the from the feeling wheels Mm. all of those oh yeah yeah that's me i'm all of those things because those are the good emotions fearful Anxious, weak, rejected, threatened. <sighs> How do those words feel? Mm-hmm. Are you as comfortable with those as you are with the happy emotions? Um, is your client, has your client been told to swallow those down or been taught by the world? We don't talk about that. We don't show anger. If you think about anger, like you say, Rory, it's a base emotion we all share. Um mm-hmm. But it has uh, the connotation, if I think anger, I don't think f- it's not a, a big leap to anger management, a special class where you go to learn to not be angry, which, of course, that's not what anger management's about, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> if anybody's ever been on it. Um, no, no, no. 
but but we may have um, clients that are coming in that the 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 emotion is not acceptable to them themselves. Us mm. naming the emotion, accepting that emotion without judgment, saying it's Absolutely. okay to feel that emotion. Wow, it's powerful yeah. stuff. This just being able to speak about and understand emotions. It is, and, and I think I'd like to, to add in, when we talk about acceptable emotions, those are the emotions we think may be acceptable. But I've certainly worked with clients who've told that being happy isn't acceptable. Yeah, I've worked with some clients whose family or maybe their community um, have told them that happiness is, um, you know, a sin or shouldn't be, yeah. you shouldn't be happy. Um, certainly, I know in my family, um one side of our family that was projected a lot onto the children that you know you shouldn't be there's nothing to be happy for in other words if i'm miserable then everybody else should be miserable and i've certainly worked with clients where you know we've talked about what happiness looks like for them because it's not something they've ever had permission to have so don't i guess don't fall into the trap of thinking it's only one emotion that can be verboten or forbidden yeah there are others yeah yeah yeah, definitely. It's it's whatever lens that that person has from their own ph phenomenological experience of life and what, the, the stories that they've built up about what is accepted and what is not acceptable to self. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I guess that brings us full circle on our uh, um, emotions wheel here uh, to where you can get this this download. Go to counselingtutor.com, click on the podcast uh, episode or the podcast tab sorry uh, find episode 315 315 right there you'll be able to download your feelings wheel we'll also link to a lovely article uh, that rory used to reference this uh this chat that we've had here called five helpful ways to grow your emotional vi vocabulary it's really nice i think you'll enjoy that um yeah and that kind of brings us to the end of student services and 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 sadly I'm, I'm i'm almost at a loss here rory to the end of episode 315 of the counseling tutor podcast the national counseling and psychotherapy society or ncps proudly sponsor this podcast supporting students every step of the way join the ncps for resources training and a friendly knowledgeable community to enhance your learning experience visit ncps.com so we started off with ethical sustainable practice and we looked at neurodivergence the growing edge of people who see the world um, differently and how we need as therapists to adapt to those operating systems to adapt to the fact that people may think or, or view the world in in a completely different way to the way we view the world on to practice matters we caught up again with our good friend ali finch who talked about using digital tools in an online therapy session and of course she was talking about a fantastic lecture that she's produced for the cpd library for qualified therapists and then finally in student services a walk down the emotional lane of life where ken and myself talked about how to develop an emotional vocabulary as a counseling skill and don't forget that free download and just a little favor from rory if you cut off for Rory, if you if you like this episode, why don't you share it with your peers or, or people who may find this helpful? And if you could leave us a bit of a review on your podcast platform, be it iTunes or Podchase or whichever podcast platform you use, um, that'd be lovely. It makes it all worthwhile. But me and Ken can have a look at them and think that uh, at least someone out there is, in, <laughs> is, is appreciative of the work that we put in. And as always, stay grounded and stay safe. Take the stress out of your counselling studies and get the support of Rory and I by joining us in the Counselling Study Resource. Counselling Study Resource, or CSR for short, is the world's most comprehensive assignment guidance and study support resource for students just like you of counselling and psychotherapy. See how Counselling Study Resource can help you. Visit counsellingtutor.com. That's counsellingtutor.com. Thank you for listening to the Counseling Tutor Podcast. Find the show notes for this episode by visiting counsellingtutor.com.